Welcome to chapter 14 of the book of Philippians. This book is another one of the prison epistles. We'll talk about possible places where Paul wrote it later on in the slideshow. Pauline authorship is not disputed in this letter. This is one of those undisputed letters where everybody agrees that Paul wrote it. One of the most beautiful parts in this letter is what's called the Christ hymn or the Christus psalm, sometimes it's called. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. If you read that, you'll know very quickly is that's the passage, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross, the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that is a great hymn and very enigmatic. I remember the first time I preached this passage, I realized how deep the theology, how rich and how marvelous this passage really is. So was this hymn written by Paul or not? Well, it could have been. Some say it was a hymn that was circulated in the church that Paul really approved of and loved and put it in this letter. Its language and its rhythm are more fitting to Hebrew or Aramaic poetry in the reference to Christ as servant, whereas elsewhere Paul doesn't reference Isaiah's servant songs. But there's no reason that Paul could not have written it previously and then inserted it here. The phrase death on a cross is very Pauline. Um, Paul, in, he frequently interrupts his flow of thought in other letters. Traditionally, it was used as a solemn doctrinal pronouncement as the basis for the canonic theories of the Incarnation. Now, what's a canonic theory? It's from the Greek word kenosis that means an emptying. What does the emptying mean? Great church councils have debated this. So you need to get this nailed down in your theology. Did he empty himself of his deity and become man? I don't think so. I think he emptied himself of the privilege of remaining at the right hand of God, and he became obedient to the Father, subservient, and he took on the form of man and became a servant, but never emptying himself of his deity. He was always God, but then God became man in the incarnation. So that's what the canonic theory is all about. So you will want to uh, nail that down in your own personal theology. And get, that, uh, get that straight in your head. Uh, that's an important one. Okay. Whether Paul originally wrote this or not makes really little difference. The fact that he uses it suggests his attention, his intention to have it interpreted in the context of this letter. Where was it written? Well, one possibility is Rome. He mentions the Praetorium, those who are in Caesar's household. Sounds like Rome. Paul was in a position to organize his co-workers when he was in Rome, right? He appears to be in a location where there's a well-established church, which would have been Rome. In earlier chapters, we saw where the Roman church was not founded by Paul, but probably by Jews from uh, that got saved on the day of Pentecost, and certainly Peter didn't found it. 
although the, the Catholics want to propose that. We talked about these earlier. The Marcionite prologue suggests it came from Rome, and Paul seems to be faced with either death or release. Sounds like Rome. Some have suggested he's in Ephesus because he was in prison there as well. But Rome is nearly 1,200 miles from uh, Philippi. The number of trips back and forth from Paul to the Philippians suggest that he was closer to Rome than that. Paul says he intended to go to Philippi upon his release. So this would mean a change of mind about going to Spain. Could be Caesarea, but this was not much closer to Rome either. So if you take Rome, you would use a date of around 6162 when he was there. If you take Ephesus, then you're going to have to date this letter in the mid to late 50s when he was in prison there. If you take it from Caesarea, you're going to have to date it later, 59 to 60. Okay? Um, so, there you go. You're going to have to wrestle with that. But if you put him in Rome, at the later date, 61, 62, then uh, if you follow Lightfoot's scheme that he got out of jail and went on to Spain like he said he was going to do, and then he was imprisoned again, that accounts for a lot of things. It accounts for the, the abrupt ending in Acts, where he's still alive. It accounts for uh, this Roman imprisonment, where then he gets out, and then he goes west. And it also accounts for the writing of the pastoral epistles, that he would have written those before his death. And then he gets arrested again and brought back before Nero, mid-60s, 66, 67. And then he writes that incredible passage in Second Timothy that he's, he's fought the good fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith, he's ready to be poured out as a drink offering. The occasion. Paul seems to have written for these reasons, to address the illness of Epaphroditus, to inform the church, of his situation, to thank the Philippians for their gift, and to commend Timothy so that this would get them ready for his visit. He has pastoral concerns. The church was facing many challenges from outsiders, and he's exhorting them to reconciliation between two women who were fighting Euodia, Syntyche, He's warning against false teachers and he's exhorting them to wholehearted service. It was adopted into the canon. Uh, it's cited by first Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, and the Marcionite canon. Some would suggest that there's not unity in the letter. They want to see a break at 3-1 or maybe 4-9. They say there's a break in sense. Uh, they argue that no indication that Epaphroditus was sick in 418, because he doesn't say so. Paul's opponents are not the same throughout the letter, which seems to, um, they think, uh, strengthens their, their um, theory that this letter is disunified. There are possible fragments at 4, 1 to 9, 20, 23. And Polycarp speaks of more than one epistle to the Philippians from Paul. However, this is why I love Carson and Luke. They argue against those items and say that there is unity of the letter. Sudden breaks, in a sense, are frequent in Paul's letters. There's no reason that the illness of Epaphroditus should be brought up every time he's mentioned. The statement of Polycarp does not suggest that the letters of Paul were combined, only that there was more than one. Hey, we know he mentioned other letters in Corinth, right? First Corinthians, he mentions a previous letter. We don't have that letter. But that's no reason to say 
that First Corinthians has to be chopped up. It's likely that Paul envisages opponents of more than one kind in this letter. He's battling some who don't agree with his preaching. He's battling others from the outside that are causing the church to suffer. So the contributions of Philippians are multiple. It's a letter to a church whom Paul is very pleased and loved very much. The Christ hymn is a very early example of high Christology among believers. That's an important point. Because those who would argue for the history of religion school, that everything's developing and getting more complex, look how complex this Christus hymn is. And if you, even if you take the latest date, a Roman imprisonment, that's 61, 62. That is early in Christianity for this highly developed Christology. Hallelujah. I'm gratefully put that hymn in there. It firmly lays down the importance of preaching the gospel, and we see pa Paul's view of a partnership in the gospel there in 1.5, where he says, uh, we're grateful for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, and there's assurance amidst of suffering. What a great letter this is. Enjoy your reading of the letter itself.